This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Now, this is why I do this podcast, for the chance to have a 90-minute conversation with the former CEO of Dunkin' Donuts for 35 years. Wow, how fortunate, how fortunate of an opportunity to jump in and get some history to find out how things happened. My guest today is Robert Rosenberg. Now, his father started Dunkin' Donuts, and it was sort of small, kicking along. But Robert, once he got involved, at age 25, his father made him president. I believe that's the right age. We'll find out if I'm wrong in the episode. But at age 25, he takes over as CEO. Now, right there, what an amazing story. Absolutely amazing. How many people get to be there at that opportunity? Well, the answer is not many. And I'm so, again, happy, fortunate to dive in deep with an original American story. And I got to tell you, the Dunkin' Donuts story has crossed so many financial thresholds, IPOs, takeovers, potential hostile takeovers. I mean, what a story. This is one of those books that you should add to your reading list. So without any further delay, let's jump right into my conversation with Robert Rosenberg discussing his book, Around the Corner to Around the World, A Dozen Lessons I Learned Running Dunkin' Donuts. But I got to tell you, this is one of those books where you're going to walk away with something. So dive in. Without any further delay from me, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Robert Rosenberg. Let's go back way far in time. Your dad, your dad starts Dunkin' Donuts. Obviously, you get involved very early, but speak to me about the experience of growing up in an entrepreneurial household. You very proudly say that your dad had an eighth grade education, a guy with a presence you describe coming into the room, a real presence, a big guy that would come in and kind of own the room. Talk about growing up in that environment with such an impactful figure. He and the business dictated an awful lot of my early years, my early life. He was a figure that was bigger than life. He had started as a kid, as a real hustler, dropping out of school at the eighth grade to help support his family. And he started his career driving ice cream truck routes around Boston. He was very good at it. He really worked hard. He went into the shipyard during the Second World War, and his business really started after the Second World War. He had joined a business in Bridgeport, Connecticut after the war, and that partnership didn't last long. It was called Industrial Lunch and Service, Meals on Wheels. It was trucks that went around to football sites where kids were playing football or little office sites, construction sites where people would come out, stand in line and buy coffee and donuts and sandwiches. I remember joining him on those route trucks. It was years ago when I was about eight years old in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And as the partnership failed, he basically took the same idea, moved to Boston, moved in with grandparents, a section of Boston called Dorchester, and opened a small little commissary. Everybody in the family worked there. We scrubbed it up, got it ready. That business started to grow rather dramatically. My father took in a partner, his brother-in-law, who was a CPA, a guy he admired. My uncle put in $2,500. I think my father had $1,500 in the business. And that business grew to 150 trucks and six different depots all around New England. All we would talk about, for the most part, my recollection of my early childhood, is we talked business. It was always business at dinner. After school, I was just a youngster. I would go to this little commissary on the corner of Quincy Street and Columbia Road in Dorchester, and I'd 
clean out these five gallon coffee cans that were coming back from the root trucks. My mother occasionally made sandwiches for the root trucks. So it was really a family enterprise, very humble beginnings. That business, as I said, started to grow, but it started to falter around 1948 or so. As vending machines started to come on the scene, it started to put a dent in the root trucks and the whole commissary system and all the overhead of driving trucks was putting a crimp in the business. So as a result of that, my father and my uncle decided, based purely on happenstance, uh, one of the people that worked in the commissary that made baked goods that went on the trucks said to my dad and my uncle, there's a donut shop around the corner that has 12 root trucks and they make more money out of their one retail store than they do out of all 12 trucks. Guys thought that that might be the answer, both my uncle and my father to starting to diversify their business to something that may be more long lived. My father always wanted to be a millionaire after taxes. That was his dream as a young man. So they opened this donut shop in 1948 called Open Kettle. And it was in a converted stucco, formerly an awning shop. And it, it didn't do much business. It was a real disappointment. It was a bummer. Fortunately, the role of serendipity, a guy across the street who was formerly a band leader owned a lot of land on this place called the Southern Artery, which is a road that connects Boston to the Cape, which is where this open kettle store had opened. This guy, Mari Pearl, a band leader who had popularized the song, The Sheik of Araby, decided he was going to open a donut shop too. But before he opened it, both my father and my uncle decided to hire away his architect. This architect came in and said, oh, you guys are not doing yourself a favor with a stucco shop and no windows and you might have some good products here, but no one really knows it. you got to shine a light on it. They rip the store down. They convert. And he said, the name, Open Kettle, really doesn't tell you what's on sale inside. They sat down, had a brainstorming session. Someone said, what do you do with a chicken? You pluck a chicken and you dunk a donut, which is a skit that was popularized by a famous comedian on television in the 50s called Red Skelton. My dad said, that's it, Dunkin' Donuts, that's the name. So they took down this $1,500 a week open kettle store and they rebuilt this brand new fishbowl, California style, sharp operation, reopened it, same donut men, same store manager, same menu, same pricing, everything's the same, same location, but a different design and a different name. And that $1,500 a week open kettle, which was doing about the same as most of the 1,500 or so donut shops that existed in Massachusetts in 1948 became, in 1950, a restyled Dunkin' Donuts store and came out of the gates at $5,000 a week when coffee was a dime a cup and donuts were 55 cents a dozen. And it was a huge success. My life during that time was sort of, I figuratively grew up over the store. As a kid, when I was 14 years old, I started working in the kitchen at the commissary. At 15, I worked in the bakery. At 16, between high school and college, I pushed a canteen cart during the morning, cut cold cuts for the cold cut guy who did all the cold cuts in the afternoon. And then on the weekends, my father had a 50% interest in a Leaning Tower pizza, a pizza chain. I made 1,000 pizzas a day on a Sunday, a Saturday and Sunday on the weekends. So I learned sort of the restaurant business. What's so great about that is I can imagine some young people today, they'll hear that story, they'll say, oh, it's a long time ago, 70 years ago. But everything you just described from an entrepreneurial perspective can be redone today. We haven't even got to your part yet. We're just talking about your dad. I mean, everything about what you described is that perseverance, the grit, the trying things, the experimentation. All of that pervades is still just as important today. Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Outliers, you look for success, you're going to find it uncommonly repeatable over and over and over again. Those people that spend 10,000 hours, which comes to about three to five years, in apprenticeship in their trade are much more successful than others. And I know that was the, true in my case. I spent my 10,000 hours or more over 10 or 12 years of working summers and school vacations and subbing for store managers and a wide variety of jobs. But I did learn the restaurant business. I totally agree with you. I think that the pattern is, was true 70 years ago, and I think it's true today. We're jumping ahead in the story, but years later, I taught 
in the graduate school at Babson. And my advice then, based upon the experience that Babson, which is one of the leading entrepreneurial colleges in the country, preach, was the secret to success, not 100% of the time, there are serial entrepreneurs, but those people who want to improve your odds dramatically, spend three to five years apprenticing in the industry within which you start your business. You will have to know the market, the customers, the niches, the openings, and where you can build a sustainable competitive advantage. Very hard to know if you don't know that business. Let me keep it at your father for a few more minutes. He became an entrepreneur purely out of necessity, or was it just, I don't want to work for the man? Was that going on? What was the drive there for him? And it's hard for me that we never did discuss that. I never really knew what his true motivation, but he was aspirational. He was a hustler. He he was a big guy with a big personality and wanted to make a difference in the world. And I think when he went to work with these three partners in Bridgeport, I think he basically saw an idea that had legs. He could copy it easily and inexpensively. And as I said, we live with my grandparents. My grandmother, unfortunately, my uncle had died in the Second World War. My grandmother had gotten money as a result of his death as a soldier. And she gave my dad some of that money to start a business. And I think we started with $1,500. It was a combination of factors. Your neighborhood, Dorchester, I've not been to Boston for a very long time, but Dorchester is not exactly the the high-end part of the city, is it? It's a little more rough and ready? We were dirt poor, dirt poor. And then we, did, we didn't do much better for a while. We then moved to Roxbury. No, we lived with both grandparents, paternal and, and maternal grandparents at different times in order to launch the business. In the early years, like most early businesses, it's a learning curve and you have to wait. You have to be patient and while it grows. And we did that. But as a kid, you really don't have any perspective. So for me, that was normal and quite acceptable. And I was enthralled. I idolized my father. He was bigger than life. I was absorbed by the the stories of business and success and setbacks. I remember vividly as a nine-year-old, we took my first plane ride. We flew from Boston to Albany, DC-3. Our largest account at the time was the Water of Elite Arsenal. We made all of the big guns for the Army. It was a big account. They were up in arms because my dad had gone from a nickel a cup of coffee to a dime. And I remember sitting in the back of the union hall as the delegates grumbled and my dad took the stage and basically spent an hour trying to convince them successfully, I should say, on the need for quality over price. And he carried the day that left an indelible mark on me. Let's bring it up to jump a little bit ahead. We've got a long timeline to work with here, but let's jump ahead a little bit to age 25. You're age 25, so you are a newly minted MBA. Is that correct at age 25? That's correct. I went to hotel school and then graduated. I worked in the company for a while. And then I went into the army as a reservist and then came out and went to business school. And your father decides or looks to you or asks you and says at age 25, newly minted MBA, he wants you to be the guy that runs the business? Yes. He was 47. I was 25. He was healthy. What was your initial feeling at that? It's kind of breathtaking and unexpected. And there were problems. My father wanted to be a winner and wanted to be a millionaire. But at the time, the business was at a crossroads. The partner he had taken in that didn't get along well on the fifth store in 1955, they broke the partnership up and my father had a buy or sell arrangement with his brother-in-law and he ultimately, some of which at my urging, he bought the business for the then book value. And he then began to spin out a number of different businesses. So my uncle took the money and began a competitive company after the fifth successful donut shop called Mr. Donut. That started to grow dramatically. And my father, at the same time, after the partnership ended, began to spin out a number of different businesses, a portfolio of food service businesses. We had a 15 cent hamburger chain, a la McDonald's. We had a number of pancake houses, copying International House of Pancakes. We had a vending machine company. We had a cafeteria company. We had a delicatessen. So we were in seven or eight little businesses, including some of our Dunkin' Donut shops. My dad and my uncle were very competitive. 
My father had long argued to the same, and they shared the same circle of friends. Brothers, correct? Brother-in-laws. Brother-in-laws, okay. My mother and my aunt were sisters, and my uncle was married to my mother's sister's, it was my mother's sister's husband. It's a mouthful. But they were brother-in-laws and long-term friends and, and knew each other well. And as I say, my father, up until they became partners, admired Harry because he was educated. My father had this love-hate relationship with education. I suspect he never talked about it, but I suspect he regretted or felt that he was at disadvantage because he never got educated. And by the same token, he also oftentimes felt that he was smarter than guys that were book educated because he was so street smart and then became so successful. That was probably true, though, wasn't it? Well, to some extent. The reason why is my uncle, unencumbered by this strategy that I call failed, basically was simplified, was just opening and spinning out these Mr. Donut stores. And my father had all these different businesses and basically was going nowhere in terms of profitability, hired in an executive vice president to run the day-to-day business to try to figure out what was wrong. And the guy that was running it, the executive vice president, basically was losing confidence in the donut and coffee business. So the year before I joined in 1963, had opened nothing but full service restaurants under the Dunkin' Donut name. He sort of served hamburgers and hot dogs and full breakfast menu with eggs and bacon and nothing more than a diner with anywhere from 18 seats to 89 seats. It was a hodgepodge of businesses. So here we have my dad, who was very competitive, very aspirational. His brother-in-law had a now chain that he had, my dad had basically talked in this circle of friends that my uncle was nothing more than a bean counter and a millstone around his neck. But the facts belie that. The books at the time, the first franchise boom, the first book written on franchising, which dominated dinner conversation in my house, led off on the story of Horatio Alger, my uncle, Harry Winokur who was building the Mr. Donut franchise and barely mentioned my father on the 155th page as one of the guys that started the International Franchise Association. He was fit to be tied. They were on television giving away franchises. Everywhere he turned, his dream and his aspirations were being affected. So much so that in my second year of business school, I accompanied him to New York City to a private equity buyer and he was asking a million and a half dollars to sell the whole business. He wanted out. And the business was only earning $100,000, and the private equity guy wouldn't pay it. And I had the impression that there were many people that he had talked to similarly who were unwilling buyers to make him the millionaire after taxes he always wanted to be. And I think it was in that backdrop of frustration and, and consternation that he turned to me, a green 25 year old graduate, and asked me to take over the business. It took six weeks to make up my mind and ultimately decided after being there a while that the problem lay in leadership. And I thought I saw a way to success and I agreed. We're still in the period, let's say between 63 and 68, well before that IPO. So once your father, you get involved, you start to get your feet wet, you start to understand things. Your story is so roller coaster. The family story, the whole business story is so roller coaster for so many decades. It's an amazing, amazing story. But initially, once you start to take control, your father, though, also is still pushing for a sale. So here you are as the leader, as the president. There must have been some unusual moments when he was looking for that sale. And you were probably thinking, huh, I'm a young guy. I think I can make this thing a lot bigger. You're absolutely right. There was a lot of tension. I loved my father. I admired him. But increasingly, as I got my arms around the business, it became clear to me that we had a different life story. We had a different style and we had different aspirations. And there was tension. But the business immediately after I got there, I changed the strategy of the company and started to focus brought in friends from business school to help me. We started to take off dramatically. And as the values grew, his intention to still sell was stronger. So before a few years, I was sitting in front of Nate Cummings, the conglomerateer who put together Sara Lee and Consolidated Foods in his beautiful apartment in the Waldorf Towers and being offered seven and a half million dollars to sell the business to Consolidated Foods. As you can imagine, that kind of offer, given the history that we had just a few short years before, 
created lots of conversation and quite truthfully, a lot of tension. I decided not to sell, not to take the offer. We continued on from there and Nate Cummings bought a company called Chicken Delight, which was a very successful chain, but had bad contracts. And as a result of the contracts, lost their business in a trouble action antitrust lawsuit. Yes, there were cross purposes. So your father, though, he gave you the power, though. I mean, you and I can go through many corporate stories. And I think what's so unique about yours, perhaps there's some other names that I'm not aware of, but I think what's so unique about yours is at that point in history where franchising is taking off, you get to be in the catbird seat, making decisions, managing risk, taking chances, and starting at the age of 25. It's just, it's really an amazing story, huh? It is. I have to give a lot of credit to business school. In my business school days, I had the opportunity to study under some terrific, very, very famous teachers. One who taught retailing, Walter Salmon, another guy who taught business strategy called Cy Tillis, Seymour Tillis. Those two classes were real life laboratories where I could sit in business school and write my papers about the company that I was going to join as an apprentice called Universal Food Systems, that potpourri of, of eight or nine little businesses. It was there that basically I had the opportunity to be able to think through what would I do if I had the opportunity to run it, what works and what doesn't work. That was very, very useful to me. So when I came, I had a real understanding of the role strategy plays in the success of a business. It really does spell the difference in terms of what you want to be and what you want to have. That helped dramatically. And also the ability to be able to recruit some of my classmates, some of the best and the brightest, right out of school and out of Goldman Sachs is where they came from, two of them, both my CFO and also the head of administration. It was a band of brothers that were now running the company. It wasn't just me. Those were very, very helpful things. My father could teach me about quality, but he didn't have the experience of growing in a larger business. He was stymied. And I think that was the reason I actually got the call. Luckily, because of school, because of the context, because of the training, it was, can't put an old head on a young body, but I had some inkling as to what to do. And I guess I had the ability to make decisions. I don't see myself as a very forceful personality. I certainly wasn't the same old as my dad, but whatever it was, it was the right thing at the right time. We were very fortunate it worked out. Now, before I bring us up to 1968, a really pivotal year, as I mentioned at the top of this podcast, you brought up quality a second ago, and there's an interesting, fun story in your book, and I think my Southern mother would probably say the same thing. There was an associate, a friend, I can't remember, a family member named Charlie, and the discussion was around pound cake and the secret ingredient. Why don't you tell that story? It's so good. Yeah, my father had developed stage two diabetes, I guess, about age 50. So he would spend his time at Durham at the rice house. That's probably not there anymore, but it was a, a rice diet that was guaranteed to cure what ails you under the auspices of Duke University. There he met a fellow by the name of Charlie Lubin. Charlie was a baker and he had developed a pound cake formula and named it after his daughter, Sarah Lee. My dad comes back and says, Bobby, you got to go meet Charlie. Charlie's now living in Chicago. So I remember getting on a plane, flying out to Chicago, and Charlie invites me to his dining club high upon the loop in Chicago. And we're sitting there at lunch. And I said, Charlie, my dad tells me that you really get good advice for a young guy like me. What would you advise me? And slowly but surely, Charlie, I think he grew up in Brooklyn, leans over the table and he says, Bada. I said, excuse me? He says, Bada. I said, I, I don't understand. He said, what do you think a pound cake is? I said, I have no idea. He said, a pound cake is a pound of flour, a pound of sugar, and a pound of butter. Goes on to tell me that there's nothing like the real thing. When you're dealing with food products, cream, butter, real fruit, I mean, that's the answer to really a delicious tasting product. And I remember on the ride home on the plane, I just kept mulling over in my mind. I said, you know, here's this guy who built he was a baker from Brooklyn who built this whole empire, great products, basically on quality. And my dad had done the same thing. My dad was a nut for quality. And it was the one thing he instilled in me from the time I was at the Water Valley Arsenal is always pick quality over in price. Go for the best. Go for the real things. 
And I made a vow then on the plane ride home that I would do everything in my power over the years to be guided by that principle. So if I had to pick what separated us and why we were able to do so much better than the literally scores of other donut shop chains that were starting at the same time, there was Mr. Donut and Tim Horton and Winchell's on the West Coast. And in Texas, there was Shipley's and Lone Star. You thought there was Pelt and Spudnuts. There were lots of chains in New England, Best Eaton. And so we were really surrounded by competition, pretty much at the same size. We weren't all that dominant. And I think the reason we sped ahead and were able to get to the top of the pack was we basically focused on three Ps, I called it. Planning, people, and product. Those three Ps. Product was the tri-legged stool. You pull one leg out, the thing would tip over. And we built our business over the years, really focusing intensely on those three Ps. So you joined 63. The value of the business in 63 was around a little less than $2 million. Is that the right number? Well, it must have been less than a million and a half. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're laughing, but we're not really laughing. We're just kind of like, I mean, the reason I bring that up is because we're going to go to 68 now and IPO. And all of a sudden, we've got a valuation at what? $120 million? Yeah, the business started to grow when we started. Basically, what the strategy was, was to not to put any more assets and resources behind the other businesses. Focus all of our attention on the diamond in the rough that was in our midst, which was Dunkin' Donuts. We standardized the Dunkin' Donuts to a 20-seat operation, 52 varieties, originally 28 varieties of donuts, but 52, a six-ounce cup of coffee and a porcelain cup that was served around a question mark counter and a six ounce cup of coffee to go. So we highly streamlined it and we said we wouldn't go and sell a franchise when anybody wrote us and wanted to open one. What we would do is we would try to focus our attention in certain markets. They're called statistical marketing sales areas, SMSAs, where we could build our brand, where we could advertise, where we could supervise. So we streamlined and focused and basically began to take throttle back, decide not to open any more businesses and focus all our energy and attention, as I said, on the diamond in the rough that was in our possession, which was Dunkin' Donuts. And that business started to grow. So the earnings went from 100,000 within five years. We were up around $700,000 after tax profits. McDonald's had gone public a few years before, Kentucky Fried Chicken. We were the third one out. I had to sell to go public in order to be able to satisfy my pledge to my dad. The reason I told him we couldn't sell to Nate Cummings and Consolidated Foods and or to Nestle's, who was also nosing around in those days, basically was that we would come out far better. We were on a path. I had to figure out when do you sell a business? I had to convince him. I was never successful really at convincing him, but I came to the conclusion, this is one of the things I'm most proud of, was you do not sell a business just because someone comes in and offers you a big price. If you love the business, if you have the ability to achieve your objectives, I'll say that again, if you have the ability to achieve your objectives consistently, then you shouldn't sell your business because once it's gone, it is gone. And it's hard to reproduce that. It takes years. It takes a bit of luck. It takes the right timing. A lot of things have to be in place. And if you've got this opportunity to continue to grow your business and achieve your objectives. In my view, you don't sell. If you're healthy and you can see a way future clearly to keep growing, and that's what your goal is, see an opportunity to make it maybe generationally in your family, that's a huge asset and a wonderful, wonderful asset that you never would let go. I love that advice because I think that so many people imagine the pot of gold but then maybe they have something successful going on and they think about getting out. They imagine the pot of gold. If you get out early and you have some pot of gold, what do you do? Just sit around? The fact is my dad, when he did get the pot of gold, even before that, when I joined, he left the office never to come back, really, only for board meetings. He went to New Hampshire where it was a cheaper tax state. He had made four and a half million dollars the day of the public offering in 68, five years later after I had taken over. And he started a horse business and he built another business. He started to raise and race harness horses, which he loved. And he got engaged in legislation to create agricultural products to help stakes for big stakes races. He had partners in that business as well. 
And he did well up until 68 when he had a full dispersal. But he had to recreate himself, as did I when I left them. And it isn't the easiest thing in the world is to create second and third careers. Well, he did, and I did as well when I, my playing days were over. That was my point, is I think ultimately us human beings, are if we have this way of thinking to go get it and to try and to take those risks, it just doesn't go away when you get older. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. And so long as you have a breath in your body, if you have a project and you have a clear idea what you want to be and what you want to have, until that last breath, my advice would be to keep on trucking. That's the secret to, I think, degrees of satisfaction and then even some degree of peace. Even though there's some agenda associated with your striving, it's a far better way to live a life. So I couldn't agree more. You come out of the go-go 60s, you got the IPO going. I mean, things are looking pretty rosy. 73, 74 bear market, things started to change, huh? It wasn't the bear market that started to change. It was me. Basically, I became involved in the International Franchise Association at a young age. I was scheduled to take over the chairmanship in 1970. The guy ahead of me in the chairs was a guy by the name of Al Lappin, a California guy, 10 years older than me. And his vision was basically that franchising was a vehicle where you could basically plot out lots of different business and use the franchise system of distribution as the common core. And he tried to buy the company, Duncan, and I wasn't interested, but I became intrigued by his idea that franchising, and I had been growing at 50% a year compounded in earnings for the prior five years. And I was intent on trying to keep that rate of growth up. It was heady. I was sitting on top of a business now that was worth on my 30th birthday, maybe 160 to $200 million in terms of market value. My head was turned by public ownership and the need to keep up the pace, the beat. And I changed the strategy of the company from being a very focused donut and coffee company. And I began to sell off all the other businesses rather quickly. I sold off the cafeteria and vending company to Canteen, closed down the Howdy Beef and Burger hamburger stands, closed down the pancake houses, and got out of all the other businesses, all the extraneous businesses. So I focused and we went public. Not as Universal Food Systems, the company that I took over, the portfolio of businesses in 1968, we went public as Dunkin' Donuts. I began to think about a change in strategy from a focused donut and coffee company where we've been very successful to a portfolio of franchise businesses as a way to keep the beat up. Bad mistake. As a result of that, we lost our focus. We started a fish and chips chain. I was creating franchise learning centers around the country. I was talking to Hat Corporation of America about a series of retail haberdashery stores around the country and took my eye off the ball, tried to do too many things at the same time, growing too quickly, pushed the organization. And we began to start to flatten out earnings. And then ultimately in 1973, we lost $1.7 million. And luckily, someplace in the early 70s, I realized the era of my ways had started to change. But I was leading the company off a cliff. I was doing the very same thing my father had done 20 years earlier. But did you have anybody, a mentor or anyone pointing it out? Or is this self-reflection that you decided, man, I've gone the wrong way? A combination of both. When we went public, we had to bring in a board of directors. And the board of directors comprised of my father, myself, one of my professors at business school, Milt Brown, the Lincoln Filing Professor. And a lawyer friend of ours who had helped us set, create a stock option program, who was a partner, soon to be the managing partner of Ropes and Gray, a very prestigious and wonderful law firm in Boston. And that was the board. And Milt turned to me and said, you know, Bobby, you can always tell how long people know me by what they call me. Bobby were the people who know me the longest. So Bobby he said, I think it's time to get out of all these businesses. Just focus, really focus. I know you've withdrawn all the resources from behind them and you're not growing them and you're not creating new ones, but I think it's time to fish a cut bait. And that was very influential. And when I started to spin out a lot of stores, I was not only changing the strategy of the company, I was upping the beat in terms of store openings up to 140 a year for Dunkin' Donuts. Archie Southgate, the lawyer from Ropes and Gray says, you know, what would happen if you grew at 40 stores a year and you basically cut back and you weren't pushing the organization so far? Would you create more stability? And my first reaction was, I can't do that. Stock price would fall and this would happen. I had a lot of reasons. It was hard to change directions. Luckily, I had taken a course again at business school and knew of this new phenomenon that was occurring over at MIT called modeling. 
and the ability to model by computer. The head of IT for the company had been an MIT graduate, and he, I asked, said, Tom, can you do this? And he said, yeah, I can create a model easy. And before I knew it, I had a model, and we as senior managers sat around, and lo and behold, we could drop the pace from 140 openings to 40, get our arms around the business, stop diversifying, go back to our core business. And I had done that before we had taken the watch. I realized the error of my ways, partly because of these two advisors who were board members that had given me direction. And luckily, I liked them and respected both of them. And that helped a lot. There is a big advantage. It doesn't have to be a board of directors. It could be advisors. It could be friends. But to have a forum where you discuss your business issues can really be a huge benefit to people running businesses or running your life for that matter. You can use the same processes, the same planning processes we used. Believe that. I use the same processes I'm designing my own life. I think it's worked out okay. So anyways, yeah, the answer to your question was a combination of some self-introspection. And that's, I think, when the introspection came. Our franchisees became restive as we started to take our eye off the ball and began to diversify. We weren't giving them the attention and the profits started to sag. New product development wasn't as prevalent. I was sitting in my living room reading this book by David Halberstam. Are you ready for this one now? Jump in. Basically called The Best and the Brightest. It was a story about Johnson and the prior Kennedy administration and their management of the Vietnamese War. What Halberstam was contending was that both administrations had put in power in place the best and the brightest that America had to offer. And all these Ivy Leaguers who were well-schooled and well-educated, smart, whiz kids, but they suffered from one thing. He called it hubris. It's the Greek word for arrogance. And they really weren't going into the hamlets and the townships to really talk to community leaders to find out what was really happening. They were relying on death counts and statistics in order to measure the success of the war. And that's really wasn't where the war was being won. It was being won in the hamlets in the hearts and minds of the townspeople. They failed at understanding that. And I'm sitting in my armchair reading this book and it strikes me. I said, oh my God, Halberstam could be talking about us. And as a result of that, I went back to the team and we sat around and we talked about this. As leaders, we are never going to bar, bar, we're never going to fault the followership. We're never going to blame the followership. It's our responsibility, 100 zero, to create a system where average people, well intentioned people, can succeed and flourish. We are going to take them in and make them allies and have them help us fix what we did wrong, acknowledge our mistakes, and take them in. And we began each of us to visit 100 stores a year, every year, talking to franchisees, traveling with our district managers, seeing if our management by objective system had been working. We created a very strong, viable advisory council system where franchisees elected leaders at district levels and regional levels, and then actually at the national level, we met quarterly with all with these people on an agenda that was very clear and specific and very clear objectives both in the district level, regional level, and the national level. And slowly but surely, we began to regain trust. The litigation ultimately got resolved, took years, but ultimately got resolved in a most unusual way, where 60, over 60% 60 of our franchisees opted out of a class action lawsuit against the company. We began to write the company. Quite truthfully, I don't think we ever looked back after that kind of learning experience. And if you can live through a failure, and if you can live through really a significant setback, and not be devastated by it, and sort of grow through it. it, leaves you, in my experience anyways, a lot better off than you were before. And that's what happened to us. And it all started with a book, the right message at the right time. My brother, I have a younger brother, he's 11 years younger than me, but he would attend a lot of these self-help programs. And he would remind me often, he said, when a student is ready, a teacher will appear. And that's exactly what I have found in my life. When I'm wrestling with a big issue, really wrestling with it, that either a seminar, a colleague, a book, chance meeting with another CEO, the lesson often appears to that teacher. And teachers come in all forms. A lot of my teachings come from my own teammates, my own colleagues. I think that's where the greatest learning I had. And it's a journey. 
I certainly didn't know these things at 25, and I didn't even know them that well at 35 or 40. It's been a continuing process and a wonderful one. To keep it at Halberstam's book for a moment, and for those listening, The Best and the Brightest by David Halberstam, please check it out. It is a terribly interesting book. I'll share with you the thing that I remember the most was a particular piece of data which McNamara knew all along. I mean, everybody early in both of those administrations knew early on this piece of data. And when I heard it for the first time three or four years ago, I was just like, wow. And that piece of data was that the North Vietnamese could put on the battlefield every year 200,000 new 18-year-olds, which meant that we were fighting the Vietnamese birth rate Now, I just can't imagine if that was truly explained to the American public in the 1960s, I think there would have been a bigger revolt than there was fighting the birth rate. Basically, they knew we couldn't win ever unless we just completely nuked the country to nothing. I think that's right. I think that the deeper they would have gotten into what was really happening, the clearer they would have become about what the real problem was and what the solution would have been. But sometimes it's hard to admit an error. And that's a hard thing for people to do. And you get yourself publicly committed. And it's hard to back down and back off and say, oops, I'm sorry, I was wrong. In my experience, it's the best strategy is try a lot of things. You think you're well-intentioned. An awful lot of strategy, a lot of business comes as it being emergent. It just serendipitously happens by things you try. Things that you're sure that you plan on are going to work oftentimes don't in actual combat or actual experience. You have to be very agile and be willing to reconceptualize and admit. So I tried, and one of the things I learned as a result of a lot of R&D projects, is try to expense them so you don't get them built up so that when you have to admit defeat or that they don't work, you basically can back away without a lot of public scrutiny and be quick. And try things. They seem to have life and viability. Iterate quickly and often. If they don't, quickly acknowledge defeat, walk away. It isn't the end of the world. It's just a setback. And there's a lot of that in life. Life is lumpy. And there's a lot of that in business. Business is lumpy. There are things that work and things that don't. And you got to be willing to try a lot and be willing to acknowledge them. But you need to be at the grassroots level. You really have to be hands-on. You can't walk away. And you can't fall in love with your plan and your objective. If it's not going to work, it ain't going to work. There was a book written years ago, another book, another teacher. Max Dupree ran Herman Miller, and he wrote a book called The Art of Leadership. He said the the real job of a leader is just two things. One is to say thank you, and the second is to define reality. And that struck me. Define reality is easy to say, hard to do. It's not what you want the world to be like. It is not the skills and the sets that you would think you have, but what is it really? What's the competition like? What's the customer like? What do you like? Be real introspective about yourself, honest, brutally honest about your strengths and your weaknesses, and try to match those up. Reality is a hard thing to define, but the best leaders in the world are the ones who most accurately define reality. And that's what you're talking about, Michael. That's the reality was the 200,000 new recruits every year. That was reality. Before I bring us back into into the timeline, so to speak, of things and get us into the 80s, I want to take a pit stop at donuts themselves and the variety of donuts. I want you to tell me something interesting, provocative, all these different flavors and types. Is there one particular story that jumps out about a style of donut that became a hit and where the idea came from? What are some of those things that, I mean, if this has been your life, it's so damn cool to have a chance to experiment all these flavors and consistencies and what people like and what they don't like. Tell me something about donuts and what people like and what you learned. You find some of the best ideas come from the people on the front lines, and those are the franchise owners. I know that McDonald's Egg McMuffin was created by a franchise owner in 1972 or three. I can't remember the exact year. I get a call from an old friend. He was a donut man. He started his life as a donut man in Natick, Massachusetts, our third store. And I actually apprenticed under him as I was learning how to make donuts. His name was Bob Demery. He then went on to buy a couple of stores in Connecticut, stores that I actually had run after college, after hotel school. He called me and he said, I got to tell you something. He said, my wife, Edna, he was in a mixed marriage, a racially mixed marriage. My wife, Edna, 
has created these donut holes that are phenomenal and we are knocking the socks off of what's happening. We get we're, our business up 12, 20 percent and we're selling these donut holes. And I said, oh, you know, donut holes are things that we've been doing forever. We take the centers out of the first cuts of the donuts and we would wrap them up at Halloween and put them in these little cellophane bags and put them on the countertop into these potato chip clip holders and we'd sell them around Halloween. He said, no, 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 Bob, you don't understand. He said, Shh. Edna created a new die cut for the donut cutter. She's making them bigger. So every munchkin, or the way they didn't call them munchkins in those days, every donut hole was one fifth of a donut. And she's putting filling in them and she's frosting them and she's sugaring them and, and honey dipping them and, and piling them high in the showcase. And the customers are going crazy over them. So well, that sounds interesting. We all got in the car, myself, Tom Schwartz, who was the COO of the company, and my close ally in building the business, and Bob Camerson, I think, was heading marketing. We drove down to Hartford, and sure enough, we walk in the store and hear these delightful treats piled high in the store. We knew right then and there, absolutely, Edna had come upon a, a phenomenal winner. We went back and we went to our, not to our regular agency, but to an agency that had worked for us temporarily, Hill Holiday, which ultimately came one of New England's largest and among America's largest advertising agencies. Not at the time, they were still young and just starting. It was called Hill Holiday and Cosmopolis. And Steve Cosmopolis was sort of the creative guy of the agency. And he said, let's call them penny poppers. And we thought for that about a week or two and said, you know, it's the gas lines are growing. Nixon is inflation growing. He's putting a wage and price control. We can't keep these things at anywhere near pennies. They're going to grow more expensive than that. Can you come up with another name? And they came back and said, every year they run on CBS, I think it is, they run The Wizard of Oz. And they got these little characters in The Wizard of Oz called Munchkins. Let's name it Munchkins. We investigated. And here again, Archie Southgate, the partner from Ropes, who was my board member, he had contacted the company that owned the name, Jack's Cookie Company. I think they're in Louisiana. And they hadn't found a use for Munchkins. So Archie negotiated a dollar a year license to take that name. And we developed a pots of boxes and buckets. And we sold them in 10, 20, and 30 buckets, or you could buy them individually. And in 1972 or 73, again, I can't remember the exact year, we launched Munchkins, and it was a phenomenal success. It speaks just glowingly the need to listen and about the creativity and the impact that your franchise owners as independent businessmen have on the course of the business. That was another just phenomenal year in our history, despite all the problems occurring in the environment because of that new product. And it's to this day, it's still a huge winner. Let me share an experiment with you that I just observed actually today. I took a picture of it. I should send the picture to you on Skype after this. McDonald's only came into Vietnam five or six years ago. They probably only got about a dozen shops in the country. It's just not been accepted. The food is probably twice as much as a banh mi, and people prefer the banh mi. Maybe they got involved in Vietnam too late for all kinds of reasons, whatnot. Anyways, I walk by in a McDonald's in a mall, one of the few, and I see a big sign, and it says, the new, the Vietnamese pho burger. So they've taken the notion of the pho soup, and they've created a burger from it. And I said to myself, is that a good experiment, or is that a Hail Mary? The idea of that pho soup is a burger. I don't know. We'll have to see. But it's really interesting to watch, to see that firsthand where somebody's trying because they can't get the penetration. They can't get the Vietnamese audience to eat burgers. So they're trying anything they can to get the audience. My guess is it will be a success. I know of McDonald's opening in India. And I know of Duncan. As we go to these different countries, each has different cultural habits. So you can't pick up your American concept and just land and parachute it in and expect it to be successful without modifications to the culture that exists within the country. They will experiment enough with enough products. I think in India where people don't eat meat, they still have a thriving business. So they've been able to develop a series of products that meet the customer need. And it's based off of this service delivery system. McDonald's was devised a Henry Ford style production line to deliver sandwiches inexpensively, good tasting, and they will find a way to do that that meets the culture, in my view. I think if I had to bet, I bet they're going to be successful. Speak to your forays into international. When did that happen? Where was the first 
country outside the States where Duncan got to? Well, the first one was Canada. When I got to the company in 68, we already had a store in Sherbrooke, a suburb of Montreal, it was successful. But that was an easy one. That's not far from New England, not far from Boston. As I got there into the business, probably in 64, a year or two after I started, my dad had come to me and said, I understand Mr. Donut's going on a trade mission by the State Department. They're going to Germany and England. And boy, we can't let them beat us. I mean, you can't imagine the pressure that I was under for these donut wars in the early years. It absorbed every element of my waking hour, how we were doing against Mr. Donut. It went so far as the fact that I had to write a book in 1968 called Profits and Franchising to redo the omission that Harry Kirsch had created in his book called The Franchise Boom a few years before, which rightfully placed the creation of this new donut phenomena with my dad as opposed to my uncle. It was top of mind. So I said, yeah, that makes sense to me. So my dad went with the former executive vice president who was still out of work. And they went to England and in Germany. And they were in all the trade press. They're going to open 400 stores. And I was swept up in that commitment. We opened in England. This guy, I hired him back, the executive vice president, to head up the operations in the UK. He took a fancy office, had a chauffeur, <laughs> and a lot of money. The English hadn't taken to coffee to go in paper cups, and they basically saw it more as a bakery and didn't buy the beverages. It was a tea-drinking country in the early 60s. And a premature introduction. I didn't have the smarts or the strength, width of knowledge to be able to adapt the concept to the country. I was busy doing other things and basically had to close that operation down. But that was my first foray. The second was in 1970, when Mr. Donut again had gone to Japan and had issued a license to a very good company called Duskin that I had a long-term relationship with. Uh, we went on a trade mission and we found a large company called Cebu that owned supermarkets and department stores and they owned an intercontinental hotel chain and they bought the license for Japan. So in 70 or 71, we launched, while I was doing all these other things, <laughs> also launching in Japan to beat Mr. Donut. That was the cry in those early years. That was the motivation. That was the gut I choose going was our competitive battle in the donut wars. It shaped everything we did. Let me keep you at you for a moment, because going through the book, I mean, in some ways, again, I see a lot of business books, but I love yours because there's so much depth to it. And there are so many ups and downs and so many different pieces of finance are explored. But how did this all affect you personally, all these roller coasters? Have you, were you always in kind of an even keel guy across the many decades of doing this, 35 years? Did it wear on you in ways physically, mentally? I mean, how were you? As I look back, I don't want to disappoint. I always wanted to please. I wanted to please my dad. I wanted to beat Mr. Donut. I wanted to make him proud of me. I loved what I did. I loved the people I did it with. So I loved my work. I had a real passion for my work. I loved the brand. Early in life, I had major setbacks, setbacks kids face. I basically, I mean, I didn't get into the college of my choice. I really wanted to go to Cornell Hotel School, and I didn't get in as a high school. And I had a C in English, and I went to the second best hotel school in those years, Michigan State. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I was a straight-A student, president of the largest dorm in the country, Robert Shaw. Hall. It all worked out for the best. And I suspect out of that kind of those kind of lessons of finding that I always had a second bite or a third bite of the apple that I became persistent. So I was blessed with the ability, I think through life's happenstances of being persistent. And the fact that I loved what I did and I had confidence that ultimately we would find our way. I don't remember being crushed. I was disappointed that I had disappointed and that saddened me. I had confidence we'd find our way and I did love what I did. So based on the fact that I had some experience with persistence, and the fact that I was buoyed by the comradeship of the team and, and it got us through. I'm sure I had low moments, but that's not what sticks out. What sticks out was the lessons learned and the pride I took from that. And the fact is that in my life, no matter what comes, persist, carry on. So long as you have a breath in your body, there's another day. I was watching last night, we gone with the wind. Tomorrow's another day. That's how the movie ends. Scarlett O'Hara said, oh, tomorrow's another day. Before I take you up to the late 80s and kind of a sale, I want to share, there's a book that I saw a few years back by 
a professor who recently passed away. You mentioned Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours of effort was based on a professor from Florida State named Anders Ericsson. He wrote a book called Peak. It's fabulous, just about deliberate practice. But he did some research about taxi drivers in London. They had to memorize everything. They memorized all those streets. I know that. I yeah, yeah. Watching us in England, so. They looked at the MRIs and they were able to realize that the shape of the brain would change while they were active drivers. And when they weren't active drivers, it would kind of start to shift some. I guess the reason I bring that up is people might not know this right off the bat, but you're not 55. We're talking about a lot of details. I think it probably should be inspiration for folks. I think you're 79, 80, 81. I'm not sure. 82. 82. Okay. And an active Pilates adherent and uh, try to balance my brain, but you're on to something. I'm in Pilates and yoga at 51. So uh, you got 30 years on me. But the reason I bring it up is I wonder, and I'll let you speculate some, the idea of you spending so much time working your mind as a muscle, there's something to this. And I don't think we talk about it enough in society. The idea of how much you work the mind, it does connect with the physical body as well. I think they both apply. That's my experience is basically you have to have projects that engage. So I'm now on my third career about thinking about my fourth major project. And I try to balance my life between physical health. So I spend many hours a week keeping myself physically fit as I can. I try to do some intellectual work and I spend a lot of time with family, with my grandchildren, traveling with them. It's intention. You've got to be intentioned about it. I don't think there's much question that you will live longer if you keep your body limber and light. And I think your mind will stay more active if you keep it engaged. It's another muscle. And I think your whole attitude, you tend not to get old if you basically have things that really excite you and encourage you. My next project after the book is basically a sort of dusting off an old idea from 1968 after the riots, after the last civil rights and justice issues came to fore, about creating enterprise zones of a bunch of complementary franchise businesses, SBA approval, so much distrust I couldn't launch it. But I'm thinking about starting to do that after I get through my book promotion. I totally support what you're saying. And I find that it was very true in my life. I don't know if I was fortunate because of genetics, but basically I think if you are intentioned and you're planned, I'm taken back to something that I read years ago in a road less travel by, I think is Scott Peck was the right. That was a popular book maybe 30 years ago. Great author, great author. Laziness is the greatest evil. I think you have to guard against that and having clear plans and being very intentioned about what you want to be and what you want to have and the four or five strategic levers you're going to pull to do that apply as much to your personal life as it does to your business life. And I try to do that. I try to be very, very explicit about that, write them down and follow them. You have to be engaged. It just won't happen unless you're intentioned. I'm supporting your position and your observation. I'm a green tea drinker, unsweetened green tea. So I'm not a coffee guy, but I want to talk coffee for a moment. I was in grad school in London in the early 90s, and there was this nice coffee culture, no Starbucks. And then within five, six, seven years, Starbucks were everywhere. I'm a little bit surprised because I did not realize it seems like, I'm not going to say different audience, but I guess I was a little unaware of how much effort went into Dunkin' Donuts coffee. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of effort, much more low key, at least for my casual observation, much more low key marketing of the coffee than a Starbucks, but obviously a huge loyal following that knows exactly how much effort you guys put into your coffee. Thank you for observing that. Over the years, it had gone from maybe 40% mix, 35 to 40% mix of sales to today where it's over 60% as beverages. It's primarily a beverage business. And it is a result of a real intense attention to the quality of the product. It starts with the finest beans, the finest roasters, the finest blenders. We grind on premise. We brew so the product's always fresh. We serve with only 18% cream. It's 27 pages of specifications that go into the preparation of a cup of coffee. Hold on, hold on, hold on. 27 pages? 
Yes, it's a 27 page, at least it was in my day, 27 page specification on coffee. And, and they haven't changed the formula to this day. And they've carried on with the same formula. It's basically American beans. In other words, the beans are grown in Central and South America, roasted in the best roasting houses by great, great coffee blenders to a taste specification. Because coffee is an agricultural product. But we're fastidious. I mean, we only use 18% light cream, no ultra pasteurized, doesn't taste the same to us. I mean, we go through intense care to ensure that that product that gets to the customer is really the best. If you're going to be in this business, you, you have to have a competitive strategy. And so one of the sustainable strategies for us has always been to have delicious tasting, wonderful products. Coffee is among them and keeps growing. And it's a different business than Starbucks. At least it was in my day. Starbucks is a third place where people go to hang out, to work on their computers. It's fancy or different brews. It's different sizes. It's grandes and macchiatos. And Dunkin' is you know, small, medium, large cups. It's basically still a conveniently derived business. More fast food doesn't have a lot of places to lounge. Today, they're edging into each other's space, but not in my day. I think that there's a reason why the business has been successful is because of the quality of that product. Let me take you up to the late 80s. Mike Milken, leveraged buyouts, all kinds of stuff. I mean, here you're, again, so many different periods in your career, so many different things to live through and observe. Boy, that whole period, 86, 87, all the leveraged buyouts before Drexel went under, boy, that was a pretty crazy period to be living through as a business owner. There's a whole nother set of risks that you had to manage at that point in time, huh? That's true. That's true. We were a publicly owned company now. We had gone public in 68, so the 20 years had passed as a publicly owned company. The family had sold a lot of its stock. We didn't control the shares of the company. And in that era, there were people that were green mailers who came in and pushed up stock, bought it, and then got bought back by the company to go away. And there were hostile takeovers. And there was the creation of junk debt, which is brand new that Milken had identified that the risk wasn't as great as it had originally intended. So they could get confidential letters of confidence that they could finance deals. And there were a group of predators that started in the oil company, Pickens, Boone Pickens, and I guess Icon, and a lot of people that began to start to buy businesses with 5 or 10% of the money at risk, the rest of it through debt, both mezzanine and junk bond financing, taking over companies and pushing out managers. It was so strong in Massachusetts. And I was working at the time with Governor Dukakis to start to set legislation that would slow the pace down. Stop and Shop had been put in play. Polaroid had been put in play. Some of the computer companies in the North Shore of Boston, they were put in play. It was just happening everywhere. It was feverish. And they were migrating or being forced in. There was a book called Barbarians at the Gate, the takeover of RJR, a Reynolds Tobacco Company, a lot of the fabled businesses were falling into the hands of financiers, financial engineers. So as a result of that, Goldman Sachs were my lawyers at the time. We had started to get prepared for the possibility of a hostile takeover, and they started to dust off something Polaroid had used called an ESOP, an employee stock ownership program, where I could take 15 or 16% of the shares and place them in the hands of my employees. The management owned about 9 or 10% of the company. That would give us 26%, maybe enough to dissuade a predator. I was hesitant at first because in order to service the debt, I had to create a layoff and I never had laid off anybody before. I always viewed the staff as family. And this was a hard, hard decision. It was probably the hardest decision I ever had to make. And I postponed it and postponed it until one of my buddies from business school who had been a senior manager at Lehman Brothers and, and started his own boutique firm, finance firm, came in and said, you know, Rosie, that's what he called me. He sat at the edge of my desk. I remember like yesterday, he said, you're going to be struck. There are people buying up your stock. You are going to be struck. And that's when I pulled the trigger on the ESOP on the very day that they declared they had a 14D, which meant that they had bought more than 5 or 6% of the company. And I was under attack by a financier, real estate guy from Toronto, part of the, what they call the Bay Street Boys in Toronto, Wheeler and Dealer Financial guys. And they were coming after the company. And for the next seven months, I had to learn a whole brand new set of skills, a new language to try to fend off the hostile takeover. And ultimately, we tried all kinds of ins and outs and machinations and financing kinds of deals. 
they came with an all cash offer. Stock had been trading at twenty dollars before they got involved. I think the company sold for forty three dollars a share. It's almost doubled from the time they got involved. And when they made an all cash, all shares offer, I had to find a buyer for the business. I decided private equity wasn't going to be the right case because they wanted me to cut more people out to the ESOP. So I found at one minute to midnight, uh, one of our friends, which was a partial supplier, a large company in the UK that had acted as a white knight coming in to save other companies like Hiram Marker in Canada from the Reichmans and their attack, basically to buy the company. The company was auctioned off in 1989, the day after Armistice Day. And luckily, our white knight made the winning bid and bid it away from the predator who ultimately lost his empire. My guess is, and there's a lot of speculation, but we would have lost Duncan as a business, the brand, the franchisees, all their equity, had he been a successful bidder at the time because all of his other businesses had gone away. George Mann was this predator that went down. Yeah. Yeah. He basically started it with the Union Gas Company in Ontario. And that was fraught with lots of questions about the legality of it. It was under investigation by the Toronto Stock Exchange. And then he went and bought Lincoln Savings in New York. At the end of the 80s, when the real estate crisis occurred and there was a real recession, basically he lost $100 million in the Lincoln Savings thing. That closed down. Then he lost Union Gas. So had he had Duncan in addition, my guess is it would have gone down too. It would have been gone. And I mean, I just hesitate to think what would have happened to all our hard work and to all the investment of all all of our thousands of franchisees and their families. Luckily, we found the white knight. We continue to thrive and go from strength to strength in this new environment. But in 1990, a new era had dawned for the company. And I was now no longer had my board and a lot of my management team. We were now a division of a very large international business. While I've got you, let me shift a little bit to interesting experiences, perhaps interesting sharing experiences, mentor experiences in your position as CEO of Duncan for 35 years. Obviously, you had a chance to become friends with a lot of other CEOs and a lot of other interesting places, interesting businesses, names we all know, more names than we could probably talk about in this conversation. Are there any experiences or pieces of wisdom that you might want to share that came from some of your peers at various CEOs along the way? Is there anything that sticks in mind for you you might want to share? Early on, one of the first decisions I had to make was how we made our money as a company. We started off making our commissions from our franchisees as a result of kickbacks on the sale of different ingredients that they used in the store. And there was some question as to whether or not that was in fact legal or a per se violation of the antitrust laws. I had around 200 shops at the time and I was attending an International Franchise Association seminar in Lake Arrowhead. And this guy, Keith Roper, how I remember the name is because it's so impactful. He was running United Rentals and he stood up and he said, this is how I used to make my money. And I became concerned that it might not be legal. As a result of that, we converted to a straight royalty, which is no question legal. But to do that, you're going to have to sort of come clean with your franchisees and disclose to them how much you're making and promise never to make it ever again in that way. And I came back and asked my cousin at the time, who was CFO, I said, how much are we making? He said 5.2% of their sales we're making is our commission from the kickbacks. So we designed a program of four and a half percent and vowed never to make any more kickbacks and eliminate all and be totally transparent and buy more efficiently together as opposed to having us be the middlemen off of non-differentiatable products like shortening and, and milk and cream and all kinds of things that we were making markups on. Companies that didn't make that transition, this was kind of a life or death decision because it wasn't long before the companies that didn't for example, the company that Nate Cummings, I spoke about earlier, had bought Chicken Delight, where they made their money through kickbacks on paper goods and on chickens and things that they sold. They had a trouble action lawsuit. They lost, and they lost the company. It closed down. The brand doesn't exist anymore. And that was a piece of advice that was extraordinarily useful, and I learned from another CEO at a seminar I attended in 1964, probably, in Lake Arrowhead, California. 
It's amazing. I mean, so many different things have happened in your career where it was one decision. But I think also, as you talked about, when you're ready, the teacher will come. It's like when you're ready, something will happen that gives you some confidence or some insight to make a new decision. So even though it looks like in hindsight, you had to make it right then and there, maybe you didn't exactly, but it's just amazing. So many parts of your career story are just these pivots. And I just think the average person that takes a job and doesn't think about the entrepreneurial mindset, I just don't know if they can relate to that kind of right, left, straight, right, left, straight. I mean, that's your life. As a leader, you got to make decisions. <laughs> they come at you pretty quick. And you got to make a decision. And I guess I didn't have a problem making decisions. I made, a, I made some bad ones. Don't get the wrong impression. I didn't bat 1,000. I mean, Ted Williams only bat 400. I think in order to keep trust, the essence of all relationships, you basically have to keep your major promises. So in my case, if I could deliver 15% or 10 to 15% growth in earnings per share and keep everybody free, never run a foul of the law, provide great products, over time you will build trust with your followership, whether franchisees or employees, and with your bosses, which in my case was my board of directors. But in between that, I was early. If I had a weakness, it's my impatience. When I see a threat looming on the horizon, like Morton's Frozen Donuts, which was the best new product introduction in decades in the 70s, when Morton's introduced honey dip and jelly donuts in fr frozen food counters everywhere across the country, I opened a frozen food plant to manufacture donuts frozen because I was concerned. That was a failed decision. I was too impatient. I didn't make the distinction between a fad and a trend. And I've done that on a couple of occasions, including fish and chips. You don't bat a thousand by the same token. You don't stop because of that. You never let the survival of the business be at stake if you can help it. In other words, you never allow the business to get so long. You plant saplings early on to become shade trees later on as you see threats on the horizon. They don't all work out. You can't be put off that people will pick on you or claim that you made this wrong decision or that wrong decision, so long as the major ones and you don't lose the business itself. You live to fight another day. You don't run out of money. You can survive. I don't know if I knew that intuitively. I don't know how that came, but that's basically was sort of my motto. Let me see if I can read it exactly from your book. I jotted this down. The trick is to edge it out. Don't bet the ranch until you're sure, and don't hesitate to pull the plug if things don't turn out as you hoped. Absolutely. In a nutshell, that's exactly right. Better said in the book <laughs> than just now, but absolutely. And life is the same way. It's no different in life as it is in business. All we are is the choices we make about the decisions we face. Day in and day out, we're making choices all the time. And you're doing that in business as well. You just have to be prepared to make them. And if you make a wrong one, stop it and admit it and move on. But some of them will work out well and some of them won't. That's just the way it comes. I appreciate you taking the time today. I must share as a kind of a final thought. I thought to myself, and I've been saying this for years, if I could only eat pizza as my only meal and not be dead by age 52, I would probably eat pizza only. But then I was thinking to myself, as I was getting on this conversation with you, hold on, it's more than pizza. It's pizza, it's donuts, and it's bagels. <laughs> so if I could just eat donuts, I mean, there's been periods of my life where I said, gosh, those bagels I was eating every day were so good. And then one day you look on the scale and you're like, hold on, I got to stop eating bagels every day. <laughs> As I would tell my children, I seek the golden meat, moderation in all things, along with the golden rule of treat others as you would want them to treat you as you would want to be treated. I think if you go through life with those two maxims and thoughts, treat others as you want to be treated yourself and all things in moderation, I think you'll live a pretty good life. You know, I must say to the audience too, is that your book is quite detailed. I mean, it's a real tour de force of every last aspect of what's happened across Duncan. I mean, just everything we've talked about in very, very granular detail. So people are going to really have to go dive in. To me, you mentioned Barbarians of the Gate. It reads very much like those kinds of stories from the 90s, Barbarians of the Gate, Predator's Ball, it reads like all that kind of detail. So people have enjoyed those 
books of really knowing how things unfolded and to get all the various lessons. I didn't take you down all the paths that you go down in your book, but you really map out a lot of those great lessons, you know, about the sincerity, the competence, the reliability, caring, all these various issues are so important to your success. So I really highly recommend people checking it out. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate it. Are you directing anybody to a website or anything, or is it just go find the book? Yeah. Yeah. Around the corner to around the world. There's a website that Harper Collins has put up that begins to tease. I think you can get early, the publication date's October 13th, but you can get some early lessons and some other things if you sign up early and pre-order through any Amazon or BAM or Barnes and Noble or a lot of places where it's being distributed. Yeah, they put up a site. That's where I would recommend people to go. The book, Around the Corner to Around the World, A Dozen Lessons I Learned Running Dunkin' Donuts. Sir, I appreciate you coming on today. I appreciate the energy. I appreciate you going over long with me. And I hope I did not get you bored at any point in time in 90 minutes. How can you be bored when you're talking about your business and your <laughs> career? It's so exciting. It's a thrill. It's... I've got something I tell my audience. I say, when I know I'm going to talk to somebody who's been running a business and they're over age 70, I get excited because usually people just, they talk. There's no more, gosh, when I talk to young people these days on the podcast, it seems like they're thinking every sentence they say. They just don't flow. They don't let it roll. So when I know somebody's over 70, they've been an entrepreneur, I'm like, oh, yes, please. Thank you. I love these conversations. Yes, sweet. Thank you. I take that as a compliment. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this. I thought it was terrific. I thought the way you brought the questions out, the way you led me was terrific. And you did it in a sequential way and you highlighted some of the things I would have loved to have said. And I'm very appreciative. I think it was great. I really enjoyed it. Bob, thank you very much. Take care, sir. Have a good one. You too. Good luck, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.